Welcome to the Lounge of Travify Academy, where we get to hear from travel industry voices and experts to learn more about their story and what they see on the horizon for travel professionals. And I'm Stephanie Grice, and our guest today is Grace McBride, who is founder and CEO of Lucia. So welcome to the Lounge, Grace, and thanks for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, it's so fun. And I'm super excited for you to join us here today because it's been really fun just getting to know you, but also hearing what's going on with new and exciting businesses like Lucia in the industry. Um, And it's just so fascinating. So I'm really excited. But before we dive into all things, um, you know, Lucia and what you're seeing in the industry, can you just share a little bit more about your story and just how did you find yourself in the travel industry? Yeah, of course. Well, I can promise you that I did not think I was going to end up in the travel industry. I went to college for agriculture and life sciences. So that can give you just some perspective there. But uh, when I was at Cornell, I was introduced to a luxury travel agency that was kind of like a startup on campus. And I had done an internship at JetBlue uh, my sophomore year of college, and I got to travel all over the world that summer. And I just was addicted immediately ever since. Um, I had never even had a passport before coming to college. I, you know, was working in my family business over holidays. You know, we were never going out of the country very often. And so uh, I got introduced through my internship with JetBlue. I said, I have to stay in this for the rest of my life. And I found that travel agency while on campus as like my campus job. And I've been doing it ever since. And I probably will never leave the industry as a result. So found found this like travel agency, which is actually a part of Valerie Wilson Travel and Virtuoso, uh, did that for a bunch of years and then realized that there was just so much opportunity in the industry and knew I had to have my own part in it and help make a difference in it as well. So that was an amazing introduction, but very unexpected as well. That's awesome. That's so many similar stories to many of us. Like you get in the travel industry on accident and then you cannot leave. It's like, it you're not leaving. Addicting at best. And also I think it was just such an educational moment for me from someone who grew up in New York, was working, like I said, in my family's uh, small business growing up. I thought I'd probably stay in New York for a long time. And, and you know, we'd never even left the country before I went to school. And then to all of a sudden, be able to add, you know, 10 stamps to your passport by the end of a summer, it just changes your perspective on what's possible. And I think that is just so amazing for everyone to be able to have a part of. That is so cool. I know it does. It reminds you like how big the world is, but also how small and easy and accessible it is. And you're like, I want more. It's Mm -hmm. so awesome. And so you started a job or you, you started, you created a business um, outside Mm -hmm. of um, once you, was it when you graduated? And so then you sold that during the pandemic? Yeah, I started it my last week of senior year of college. (laughs) I took a class my senior spring and I took it a little bit too seriously, as I like to say. Uh, We had to do like these customer interviews and and kind of try and test out and then de-risk the idea. I did like something like 100 interviews of travel advisors in the industry. And it was such an amazing moment to realize that there is so much opportunity on the business side of the travel industry that most people don't touch. Um, I would say that was back in 2019. So a lot has changed since then. You have a lot of other fantastic companies that are helping support travel advisors now. But at the time, there really wasn't many. And so we, and when I say we, I mean me and Sarah Peters, who's our amazing COO, Um, Her and I basically, after graduating, started the company immediately, um, and that company was called TripKit. We did that for about three years through the pandemic. So, you know, grew a business, had it shut down pretty much less than a year after graduating college. (laughs) And then we had to basically shut it down until, you know, I would say late summer of 2020 until travel started actually happening again. And we rebuilt it. And got it to a point where we could actually sell it. And it was acquired by an amazing business owner that is now still running it to this day. That is so cool. So it's actually a fun little fact is uh, Travify was pretty much started very similar where uh, our CEO, David, uh, started during his MBA program. (laughs) Travify. And now here we are still to this day. So that's awesome. It's really cool. Exactly. No, and it's such a great story. I felt like growing it while in school was actually super helpful because I felt like I had so many resources around me that I could lean on. And so people, you know, maybe I was super young and naive to be doing it super young, but I had so much support around me. And that was the same for Lucia as well. And we started the company while I was doing my MBA as well, actually, um, as a result. So similar stories there. That's so cool. It's really awesome. And and so Lucia, what is Lucia? 
Yeah, so Lucia is a fantastic platform that is meant to help travel advisor, small business owners, um, and medium-sized business owners be able to scale and grow their business. So the challenge with the travel industry, especially with travel advisors, is that if unless you're a larger entity, like a Four Seasons and our Bears, et cetera, it's really hard to scale. You have no economies of scale. You're, you're one business owner, maybe two, and you're doing like 100 jobs at once. That is not very economical. There's not a lot of um, ability to focus in on skills that you're good at. And ultimately, you're spending a lot of time on things that you're either A, don't like, or B, not very even good at, um, when really you should be spending time on the things that you're fantastic at and really want to be doing. So Lucia is a freelancer marketplace, and we connect those travel businesses with expert freelancers in the industry. Um, they can be marketing specialists, social media specialists, itinerary builders, people that can do admin work and virtual assistant work. Um, but think of it somewhere similar to like an Upwork or TaskRabbit, but specifically for the travel industry. That is so cool. And so one thing that um, I think we had talked about before is I was personally noticing in the past couple of years, just, just a little bit out of the pandemic where people are starting to focus on their business, seeing how they can grow, but also outsourcing stuff and being more comfortable mm -hmm. about that. And I really started seeing that. Is that true that it's, or was that just my perspective, but were, was that actually starting to happen? And, and where is that? Are you seeing a change in the industry with that? Yeah, I would say, especially when we started TripKit at the time, that was really a period where we started to see a lot of outsourcing, in my opinion, throughout the industry. Um, I would say the pandemic, though, exacerbated that and made it much more common, mostly uh, not just because um, advisors were dealing with really big fluctuations in the industry. That's very true. So they'd have to go from zero to 60 in the matter of like two months. And it, I think a lot of agency owners and advisors realize that it's not sustainable to hire full-time employees um, for these crazy, uh, really volatile periods. And so you'll have like a summer that's super crazy busy, and then you might have a month of September that's dead. And it's just the, the nature of the industry that we're in. And not everyone follows that pattern, but it is really common. And my dad always likes to say, don't hire for the holidays, hire for the everyday. And so we realize that that's true for every business model. And you can really be able to outsource and grow your business um, better with freelancers and more scalably, but also by saving a lot of money. Yeah, it's so true. And you do, you can save so much and get incredible work with it. Um, so when you started coming up with the idea with Lucia and, and who were you uh, consulting? Were you still using some of your uh, contacts from before? Were you like, is this, am I on the right path here? Is this something like, what was the story of how it was starting to get built? Yeah, so when we were building TripKit, um, we noticed that so many people were looking for things in addition to itineraries, and we got asked that all the time. And so when the pandemic hit and we had to shut down the business, Sarah and I took a long thought to ourselves that pretty much that whole summer and the whole pandemic period of thinking like, what can we be doing to make this business scalable and make it much more accessible and usable for agency owners? Because I think it's just very one little piece of the puzzle and there's so much other parts of the business. Um, and I was actually speaking with Matthew Upchurch of Virtuoso, who has been a fantastic mentor of mine. And he reminded me that there's something called your unique abilities. And he does something called strategic coach and it teaches you about these things. Um, and he was saying that you know, your unique abilities are something that you love spending your time doing and you're really, really good at it. Mostly because, you know, the chicken and the egg, right? You're really good at it, so you love it. And also you love it, so you're really good at it. Um, but what about the other 95% of your business? What about all of the pieces that you shouldn't necessarily be spending your time doing or you're not very good at or someone is better at than you? Um, I would say talking to him was one of those moments where we realized how much opportunity there was because a lot of advisors are trying to scale and grow their businesses, but they're limited by that factor that they use only so much time in the day. That there's only so much um, skill sets that you can acquire as one person. And so by talking to advisors and getting advice from those mentors like him, uh, we just kind of realized that the opportunity was much bigger than we even realized before. That's so cool. It, it really is. And I'm sure that like the travel advisors listening, their wheels are spinning like, oh my gosh, I have an answer to the things that I need to do, but I'm not, I don't have time for, or it's not my specialty. So how does it work? If, whether you're an agent or agency looking for help with something, or you actually want to be um, a, like freelancing. So how does it work on both sides of that? 
Yeah. So I would say typically when we talk to advisors, they're like, this idea is really cool, but I don't really know if I need it in my business. I don't know how I should. Um, that is one of those moments where I'm like, if you're, if you are a team of one, a team of two, a team of three, you definitely have a use for us. Um, there's a million other use cases if you're a larger business too, but usually a lot of uh, advisors aren't really sure where to start with us, especially if they're a smaller agency. Um, so typically in, in order to find the best use case with us. I ask a lot of advisors in our demos, like, what are you really passionate about? And usually the answer is like selling, talking to clients and talking about travel and being able to provide those amazing experiences for our clients. The admin invoicing, email responses, VIPing at hotels and all those like back end details, not so much. And so when we onboard, we'll welcome advisors into a demo, show them the platform, but also walk them through their business and say, you know, you're spending 50% 50% of your day on nonsense that could be done in like a fraction of the time and for a fraction of the cost. Um, so we'll kind of walk them through that on the demos. And, and that's a really great opportunity to realize where the opportunity is. And I think there's an education component that we're trying to really roll out to make sure that advisors realize where the opportunities are there. Now on the co-pilot side, and we we call our freelancers co-pilots because you know, I, I can't help it. I just have to come up with a great name. For I it. love it. You know, and I don't, a virtual assistant to me or or admin or assistant, freelancer, all of it. I, I don't, I think there's, I think there's so much more vital to your business and hence the name for a co-pilot. And so these co-pilots, like I said, come from within the industry. They can be former child advisors themselves. They can be advisors that are getting started and maybe don't have a full book of business yet, but want to supplement their income. They could be uh, someone that is working at a hotel concierge and just wants a more flexible life, wants to determine how they get paid and how much, et cetera. So we pull from the industry. There's plenty of people looking for either a main or supplemental income that we can provide them. Um, and so if anyone is interested that's listening, whether you're an advisor or otherwise, we are always looking for more fantastic people with experience in the industry. We do vet everyone, make sure that you have a certain level of expertise and skill and go through training and things like that. But um, if you come from within the industry, there's probably a great place for you here. And what are the different types of work they can do? Do you have it laid out? Like it's, you can mm. do, I tin, we know itineraries is one because with Travify, it's been really great to work together there. But, mm -hmm. and then there's like admin or how does that work? Like, how do you come in and decide this is what I can do as a co-pilot or what I need as the person on the other end? Yeah, so we see typically three different buckets, one being the actual like travel planning and itinerary, uh, you know, curation part of a travel advisors business. So this can be, you know, you as an advisor talk to uh, your clients and talk to them about what they're looking for in their destination. You can then turn around to your co-pilot and say, can you go price quote these hotels? Can you put together a restaurant list or help curate this itinerary? Not as many advisors choose that route um, all the time because they do love that part of the business typically. But when it comes to price quoting and helping build the actual details, um, that, that that less so. So they typically tend to outsource a lot of those pieces, which can be done really efficiently by co-pilots. Then we see everything in the admin and virtual assistant category. This is by far one of our most popular categories, mostly also because it contains itinerary building in things like Access You Mapped and of course, Travify. And so we supplement all of the itinerary building that advisors have done. So they send over the, you know, here is a tour from this DMC, here is a list of hotels that they're staying at. And our co-pilots will go ahead and put all these details into a travel itinerary. And they'll put in all the details, clean it up and send it right back. And now you as an advisor didn't have to spend, you know, three hours putting this together. And then the last piece is social media content and marketing. That is a really open bucket for anything related to, like I said, marketing, newsletter writing, social media, content creation. We even have like some blog writing and things like that. Um, and so anything related to growth can fall in that category, 10 out of 10. You know, I really recommend uh, considering that category as well, just because we have some really awesome experts in it. Um, and then lastly, you know, that's not restrictive. We have plenty of requests that come through that are these like crazy one-off weird things that I never even would have thought of. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a really good idea. So we get plenty of things that fall outside of those categories. Um, it just has to do with your travel business and has to be legal, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay. What are some of the, what are some of the crazy things that have came in? Oh my gosh. This is my favorite one to tell is the fact that someone was, this was like really early too, in the days of Lucia, like we had less than like a hundred requests at the time uh, coming in. And we had an advisor who was one of our first clients and she placed a request 
to ask a co-pilot to print an itinerary for her and ship it to her clients. Now, this is not all that crazy, except for the fact that she was on a cruise in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And she was like, I need someone to ship these updated trip documents to my clients. And I'm literally in the middle of the ocean for the next like seven days. Can you please help? And I just thought that was so hysterical that someone like asked a co-pilot to literally go to UPS and print out and bind this itinerary and ship it to them. So not often do requests happen in person, but that one did. So that one was really, really funny. Um, One of my recent favorites is we actually had uh, an advisor that was working with someone for content and design and, you know, all those sorts of like marketing pieces that we talked about. Um, And they've been working together quite a bit. So this is not the first request that they've worked on together. But she had said to the co-pilot, hey, I know you typically do, you know, social media marketing for me, but my son is graduating and I really need someone to help make the graduation invitations. (laughs) Can you also help me make that just because I'm too busy right now and you're really good at this. Can you help me make the actual graduation invitations and like ship them out for me? And we did. And that co-pilot like did a whole thing for her son's graduation. And it was just hysterical because I obviously would have never thought that. Oh, oh my gosh. Honestly, though, kudos to the travel advisors for deciding like, I am going to be productive with my time and money. And mm-hmm. this is how I'm doing it. It is. I it know. is. It's just like task rabbit, like where you're like, I just need this random thing done and I'm mm-hmm. unable to do it. So that's interesting. That's so crazy. So when travel advisors come in, do they just submit um, like, this is what I'm looking for and you try to pair them or are they able to go in and look and find the person they want to work with? Both. So we'll let you review all of the co-pilots once you're obviously create an account. You can see all of the available co-pilots, their skill sets, their backgrounds. You see their photo, their bio, where they're located, their rate, all those things. So you can see everything about about them. And if you want to work with them, you're welcome to like sort through, see what skill sets they have, etc. Um, if you're not quite sure or if the list is overwhelming, which quite often I find it is, um, frankly, if you're a new advisor just joining the platform, I'd I'd be overwhelmed by like looking at all the co-pilots trying to decide who to work with. So I always recommend just placing a very simple first request, um, explaining what you need. And And we walk you through that on the platform in the demo, but you can place your first request and you can actually submit it to all, meaning like you can make it available to any co-pilot. Um, and then obviously only co-pilots with that expertise and experience can go ahead and accept it. And that's a really great way to like start trial by fire and see who you want to work with, see if they're good. Um, more often than not, you'll pretty much fall in love within the first like one to two co-pilot requests um, and find someone that you really want to stick with. But we really often see advisors using three to four co-pilots for different things. So like one that they love for their itineraries, one that they love for marketing, one that they love for invoicing. And that really speaks to the whole purpose of like your unique abilities, um, finding experts in all those categories. That's so cool. And how does pricing work for like, are they paying hourly or how does that work? So we offer uh, the ability to, and by the time this probably comes out, this will be live because we're releasing it this weekend. Um, So this is really a fun development for us is that we're releasing right now. You can place your request like at a fixed price or an hourly rate. Um, most people don't really know what to do with that and they're not quite sure how to price everything. And so this weekend we're releasing the ability to have a short term versus a long term like contract, as we call it. Um, and that's the same thing of like a project or just a request, but just using it as a better indicator of like what you need. Um, and you can do it by a set amount or by an hourly rate. So if you need just like an itinerary made, um, and you're willing to pay and you typically pay about like, let's say $50 for this, you know, X, Y, and Z. You can place the request and put it in for that amount, and then the co-pilot will do it for that set price. Now, if you want something that is either A, ongoing, or you're not quite sure how much it should be in total, you just want to work on an hourly rate, the hourly tends to be a lot simpler for pricing reasons, obviously. And so they'll typically choose hourly, and you can work with a co-pilot on an hourly basis for either a short amount of time or an ongoing period. That's really cool. And what about if um, there's any advisors who've never done anything like that? So they're hesitant, Mm -hmm. like, what if I pay all this money and then the work is not what I thought it would be? So how does that work? Or or hopefully you've never had to deal with that. But what, how would that work? If someone, I'm just thinking itinerary space, if someone did Mm -hmm. create and they're like, oh, I I need some edits and some changes that are really simple, but I don't really want to spend a whole nother amount of money or like, how typically is that working? 
Yeah, so I would say if you want something where there's edits involved or you want um, a lot of feedback, I always recommend just over communicating with your co-pilot. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever we see like itineraries, that's why I always use hourly as a good example because it's it can be flexible with that, right? So if you an itinerary is done, you're like, oh wait, I wanted all the virtual so amenities added, but they didn't know that you wanted them included. Um, you could just say, can you add this in? And then they'll just calculate the additional like 10 minutes, right? It took for them to add that in. Um, and at that point, you're not paying up until the work is done so we don't like charge you or anything up front um it's just uh you a set amount and then once the work's completed um you will charge you then if for any reason you have any issues um you know we're always here to support any advisors with any questions or feedback same to our co-pilots um because yeah i think when a lot of advisors are getting started they're not quite sure how to price or what the expectations are And so we always like to handhold them through that in the very beginning, um, just to like make that clear. That's a good point. Just overly communicate. I think that's a really good idea just for anything, you know, even if you're hiring someone like I've heard people get like college interns and, you know, just hire them and just over communicating and stuff is really important. Um, So what would you say? I'm I'm really curious on this. What is the most popular service you're seeing that Mm co-pilots are doing? By far itinerary building right now, just because it is, uh, what is it? It's May right now as we're recording this. So everyone (laughs) is building itineraries for summer right now. That is by far the hottest uh, request coming through. As we go through different seasons though, we actually see a change in requests. So when it's maybe a little bit of a a less peak season, I guess you could say, um, a lot of advisors are focusing then on their like social media marketing and lead gen. Whereas during a really crazy period, they just need someone to help like, pump out all the itineraries that they need and check all the details and things like that. So it kind of depends based on the time of year. Um, But right now we're seeing a heavy push in itineraries exclusively. That's awesome. That's really cool. Love to hear that as (laughs) we love itineraries. And that's why we want to make sure that all of the itineraries are being made. That's why we're doing like trainings with you guys too, because we just feel like there's so much opportunity to do continuous education make sure you're you know, staying really sharp at all these tools and and all the different parts of the industry. So all of our co-pilots that are making itineraries are so excited to do those trainings because they just know that they can only improve their skill set. Yeah, that's really cool because when we do, um, like we had training camp week, which is a full mm. week long of trainings um, a couple months ago. And so many people like they joined a couple and they're like, that was so helpful. And I just need to find the time to watch the rest. And right. so and that's t- very typical that you hear. And so it's like, well, here's what you can do. You can know what you need to know. But then someone else is really, really, really deep diving in and knowing everything mm-hmm. so you can use them. So that's, that is super cool. Um, a, a question that I thought of, though, is for anyone listening, like even if they're just starting to explore, like, is there anything I can outsource? Do you have any tips for how they can sit down and see what, um, if they do need to start outsourcing things or if there's Mm. ways that they can increase their productivity? Yeah, I would say there's plenty of great resources out there. Like something like I, that I like to do is every month or every quarter, at least I sit down with all of my goals for the year and all the different facets of your business. So if you look up like business model map, there's like plenty of like great little like tools you can use to like just framework your business, you know, and just think about all the different parts of it. And you come up with goals in each of the categories. So everything from your marketing to your admin, to your finances, to your operations, your customer service, et cetera. And I come up with goals in all of those different categories and make sure not just the tech piece gets addressed, but also our finances and every other aspect. And so I'll I'll always review that every month or quarter. And I know that I'm a social person, I'm outgoing, and I'm really fit for like two of those 10 categories on a day-to-day basis. And so when it comes to the remaining eight, that's when I, you know, look to outsource a lot of that or hire or make sure that I'm, you know, using the right people or tools for it. So when it comes to Lucia and being a travel advisor, um, if you are sitting to yourself and saying, I really love the travel planning aspect, great. There's like eight other aspects of your business that are either being neglected or just you're doing, but you don't have to be. Um, and if you're if you're looking to grow your travel business, you a lot of advisors I find are feeling very busy all of the time and they're very, very overwhelmed and they're doing a ton of work. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're growing the business or doing it any more efficiently or doing it any better. Um, and that feeling of being busy is like, it gives you like kind of like a runner's high of like, I'm doing so much work, but it doesn't mean you're moving the needle. And so, like you said, sitting down, planning out your business, seeing where your strengths are and weaknesses are, 
as a person and as a business, um, I would take all of those weaknesses or just opportunities to improve and consider what it would look like if you had someone that's just as good as you in your favorite parts, but doing the other parts for you. Yeah, it's so smart. Well, especially we're just seeing, I mean, travel is clearly not going to settle down anytime soon, <laughs> um, like at all. And so no. it is, it's a good time. Like maybe this summer, if hopefully when, if things ever do start to slow down a little bit for people, you know, take that time to think about it. It's really important mm -hmm. to make sure you're ma maximizing you and your life, honestly, because that's work-life balance too, um, which is really cool. And on that, what are, um, what are some really cool stories where Lucia has helped an agent or an agency that just stick out in your mind? Oh man, there's so many, but some of my favorite stories have to do with the purpose of why we were building the business and why we wanted to support other entrepreneurs. Cause that's really our goal here at Lucia is helping other travel businesses grow the way that we, you know, just feel very passionate about and passionately about. And so when we consider, you know, success stories, it's examples like we just had an agency where um, it's an all-female team. They're fantastic. I really, they're just amazing, amazing people. And they're doing a great job. They had one of their team members um, is was pregnant and she's like, I want to go out on maternity leave. But like, what do you do? Like, how do you just walk away from your massive list of clients for a couple months or a year? And how do they get tended to? How do you not lose them as clients? How do you keep them um, retained as as part of your business. And I think that's a, a struggle that a lot of the travel agency community deals with because there's so many women in the industry. It's mostly women at this point. Um, and a lot of them, especially now as younger people are coming into the industry, um, a lot of them are looking to have kids or building their family. And walking away from maternity leave is not an easy task when you're a service-based business. And so we actually um, helped that agency find a co-pilot to basically take over that agent's book of business, um, still booking as that agent, but like under her IATA and everything, but like helping support and retain all those clients and help book travel with them while she was out on maternity leave. And they do that for like months, like almost, I would say we're almost at about the six month mark at this point where they've been like collaborating with the platform so that she could go enjoy maternity leave and not lose her business and not stress about it the whole time. And that is one of the best success stories for us because, I mean, she really got to do, have the best of both worlds and didn't have to stress about it the whole time. And we got to support her in that journey and that whole agency. And they didn't all have to like share the client load while she was out or feel like she was burdening anyone else. Um, Cause I know we all have that guilt of like, am I burdening someone else? Cause I'm going out of office or things like that. Um, so I love that story. There's so many others, but that's kind of like my favorite at the moment I'd have to say. That's really cool. And something you wouldn't think about like, oh no, what do we do? You know, cause you don't, you want that part. Cause that is the thing is that a lot of most travel, but I mean, we're all entrepreneurs and where mm -hmm. it is, it's, you know, you're building something. And, um, so yeah, it's not so easy just to be like, okay, bye. Like you have that. Yeah. And as an entrepreneur, like everything, like at the end of the day, the buck stops with you, right? Like you're in charge of your business. Everything relies on you. It doesn't matter if it's Sunday afternoon or if it's Memorial Day weekend, or if it's the middle of the Christmas holiday, like it's your business. And yes, you can set boundaries and say, I'm out of office and going on vacation, things like that. But, you know, setting up uh, a successful business takes a lot of sacrifice, but I don't think it should come at the cost of like not being able to enjoy maternity leave and not being able to enjoy time with your family or not enjoying that fam trip that you've worked so hard to go on. And so we found really successfully a lot of advisors are using us for, and this is something I didn't even mention before, out of office coverage and like weekends and holidays. And so we have a lot of co-pilots being hired for like random hours or random weekdays because these agents want to be able to have a work-life balance or just make sure they're tending to their clients accordingly, which I think is a great use case as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Like you really care for clients. And that's a good point too. It's like even just like going on fams or your own vacation, because those are still work. Or if it's your own vacation, hopefully you're able to just relax and enjoy it. But but like fams and stuff, I mean, that is a whole we actually just did a podcast episode, which it's probably coming out right before this one, mm -hmm. um, where we talk about like fams and just how to get the most out of them. And it is work. It's a fun work, but it's like a lot of work. And so yeah, how do you maintain your business? I mean, that could be so 
so helpful. That is really cool. And so kind of on that is what you see for the future? Because I love looking at the future in the lens of the travel industry because of all mm-hmm. the technology and just, but it's also, it's a mix of technology, but also real human people, like how, what you're doing, bringing people, you know, together. And so what do you see the future of this looking like? Yeah. So I'll, I'll admit that most uh, business owners that aren't from in the industry probably look at us and say, you know, you're building an all service-based business. Like that's a terrible business model. You can't scale with that. Um, you know, you're focusing just on human capital and all those things. And, you know, as the industry is, as the world is moving towards much more sophisticated technology like AI, um, you know, it could seem ironic that we're running towards humans as our source of success. And I always kind of laugh to myself because I don't think it's one or the other. I really don't think that uh, the future of travel or any industry is going to only include AI or humans. I think it's going to be reliant on who can do it best when you include both and how do you make the two together work really successfully. And so the future of Lucia for us is going to be yes, how do we integrate all these technologies? How do we make sure that we're pushing the forefront on the industry's technologies, not just catching up like we always have been, um, but pushing at the front, using AI before everyone else, like pushing it now, not not five years from now. How are we using it now? Um, and teaching humans how to use it and make it really effective and how to make it better your business. And so for us, we're going to be finding ways to use AI within the platform with our co-pilots, with our agents, et cetera, to make sure that technology is at the forefront of how our humans work in the industry. And so we're going to be supporting both from both sides. And we're not going to be just working with humans and just with technology, because I really do think that finding the mix between the two, finding how they intersect together is really where the magic is going to be. I totally agree. It's so funny. We can, it's like there's no conversation anymore that doesn't have AI in it. Mm-hmm. And so, because even when you were talking about some of the things you were saying, I was like, oh my gosh, that could be a co pilot doing AI for that, you know, but you still have to have mm-hmm. the understanding of AI and how to utilize it the best. And, but right. I love what you said, though, that the travel industry is not just catching up, it's pushing the forefront of technology. It's so true. I mean, we've seen such a change in technology just since Travify has been around since mm-hmm. uh, 20, you know, 2015 what this product for advisors and it's so, I've seen it change so much and it's only continuing to go even further so that's so cool I love that yeah I agree and I also think you know a lot of uh conversation in the industry a lot I, I hear both sides like I'm super excited about AI and how to use it and then I'm terrified that it's gonna you know destroy my job and then there's also advisors that are like it will never touch my job but I will never use it and I think that's a really dangerous approach by like claiming ignorance and claiming how, you know, irrelevant it is when it clearly isn't. Um, but I think being scared of it or being afraid of it or not using it is also a mistake. Um, I think there's so much to go and seeing where AI will take a place in the industry for sure. But I think if we can embrace it and find ways to use it to our advantage, I don't think there's any harm there. Um, and I think those that do will will benefit a lot from it. But I also think that AI, like you said, is the only thing being talked about right now. But like, I know from me and a lot of my other travel tech friends and founders, you know, just the use of APIs in the industry, like finally the industry is including APIs and other um, pretty basic pieces of technology in other industries, but haven't been involved in travel in a long time. And so, you know, now we can have a lot of platforms actually speak to each other and work together, whereas before it was all these mini silos. So I think we're finally catching up and pushing forward on a lot of those aspects. And, you know, I'm excited to also see where those other parts of the industry go. That is so true. The API is huge. Yes, mm-hmm. that is and it was a not big, big, big. For so long, you know. No, yeah. Well, it's the same thing with that Travify because we will work with um, suppliers and integrate with them, and and it was always a little harder. Either the APIs were super, just crazy, untouchable, um, or they just were non-existent. And now they really are. A lot of businesses are building them, so they can easily automate, connect to other stuff, and yeah, it's really cool. So that's a great yeah. point too. I love that. And and <laughs> for Lucia too, how can people find you or get more information? Yeah. So our website um, is letslucia.com. When people, uh, you know, when I say that, it's like, how do I spell Lucia again? So it's like St. Lucia, the island is how you spell Lucia. I just say it's the Italian pronunciation. Um, so it's let's as in like, let's go lucia.com. 
Um, and you can also email me at grace at letslichia.com. Always happy to support any questions or help get you set up with any demos that you're looking to do as well. That's cool. And um, actually, I forgot to ask this at the very beginning. What does Lucia mean? Uh, I love that question because it's so near and dear to us. Lucia is my middle name. So if you look me up on LinkedIn, you'll find my middle name there. But I swear I'm not that vain. It's actually named after my great grandmother on my mother's side. Um, she immigrated from southern Italy. Uh, from an island called Ponza. And she, you know, brought her whole family over here and was just this amazing kind of family matriarch that started our family and um, raised a very strong family through a lot of dark, you know, like depression periods of time of like the Great Depression, et cetera. Um, but then the most amazing mean the meaning of Lucia it, from Saint Lucia uh, means patron saint of like sight and light. And I think the definition of travel to me is like the ability to open up your eyes and, and see the world and understand how similar the world can be and how much we have in common and how much you have to learn from other people. And so the idea of opening up your eyes is not just relevant to, you know, literally that meaning, but more, you know, figuratively of like seeing the world. And so I think it's just like a perfect storm of the word Lucia for us means opening your eyes to travel it means really strong women growing a business and families, et cetera. Um, and considering we're supporting, for the most part, a lot of moms and a lot of female entrepreneurs, it's like just the perfect meaning for what we're trying to build. That's beautiful. I love that. That is <laughs> so cool. Oh, it's really Thank awesome. You. I yeah. love that. And um, and we're actually, we're not done yet because I didn't tell you this, but I have more questions for you. So Please. we like to do uh, rapid fire questions, all just oh, fun gosh. travel related. <laughs> So are you ready? They should be easy, but if you need to pass, just let me know. It's okay. You got it. I'll do my best. <laughs> All right. So, okay. First question is, what is your favorite travel movie? Oh my gosh. I've stumped her big, already. I will say, yeah, I'm, I don't really watch a lot of TV or movies. <laughs> so, hey, you got businesses to build. <laughs> I don't really have a good answer. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't. No, that's totally fine. That's so bad. See, that's the thing that you you're you're busy building businesses, and that's a reminder mm -hmm. for myself that maybe I need to stop watching so many movies and I listen get to all work. like podcasts, music, Ooh. like books. That's more my speed. I'm a nerd, really. Well, what about nerd, so. podcasts? So let's switch that a little bit. Mm -hmm. What about what's your like? What's one of your favorite podcasts that you're listening to? Um, one of my favorites, and it's pretty much everyone else in the startup world's favorite as well. So I'm not unique in saying this, but the podcast Acquired is about the acquisition and like success stories of different entrepreneurs and businesses. Um, and so one I just finished listening to actually was the LVMH story and how that business like was started and how it became to be the behemoth that is today. And, um, you know, yeah, it's a great podcast. That's Highly cool. recommend. Yeah, That's awesome. I have to add that one to my list. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now what about what is your favorite destination you've traveled to? Mm. I would say the most out there for me that I really, really loved was the Azores Islands. And that was like such a off the beaten path trip for me. I never even knew those islands existed. They're like halfway between North America and Europe. And it's technically a territory of Portugal. And it's like going into the movie Avatar in like real life. So I guess Avatar might be a good example. Of like oh, that's a good one. Movie. Like yeah. That. So it's like literally a real life version of that movie. It's crazy. That is so cool. It's so funny. We had uh, this is a couple of years ago. We had um, someone that was like a DMO from Portugal and he was mm -hmm. talking about how you can get there. It's like from Boston, like five hours or something. Or oh, yeah. It's really it's short. It's to LA from New York. Oh, that's so cool. That is yeah, on my list. It was I really love that. Amazing. I know that's Delta cool. I, at the time, I know Delta had a direct flight. I don't know if they do anymore. I'd have to like look it up, but it was, we were going for a fam trip and I, and they took us to all the different islands. And one was like volcan volcanoes and like massive hiking. The next one was like flat and super lush. And the next one was like much more like deserty, like farmland. It was crazy. And they're that's all like cool. next to each other. It's wild. Wow. Okay. Add that one to the list. <laughs> I always to. do. I'm always adding a lot more in here. Mm -hmm. um, so then a little flip to that is what do you think is the most underrated destination to visit? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Actually, I would say the most underrated. Oh, that's so tough. I would say the most underrated in like my family or like me and my circle, I would say I'm always trying to get people to like go to Poland. And a lot of people never really consider going. And I went to Warsaw um, with a friend in college and it was like one of the most amazing 
eye-opening experiences because just the architecture is so different and you know it's more on the eastern side of Europe and it, it was just such a different city compared to you know Ireland or London let's say um and I learned a lot of history there so definitely underrated maybe no, don't think to go there all the time but I I'd recommend it I agree I feel like more people they'll stick to like the you know the Italy, the France, yeah. Germany. And I don't blame um, you, so, trust me. Like yeah. I love all those too, obviously. They're, but um can't go wrong. Yeah, can't go wrong like trying some new places and you may you know, you may not choose to go there year after year. I don't know, but um it's worth at least going once. Cool. I like that. And <laughs> okay, so another question here is what is the best meal that you've had while traveling? Oh gosh, that is cruel because I'm such <laughs> a foodie. Um I had a Oh gosh, that's so hard. We did a, a cooking class in Italy with um, Amago Artis. They they do like these great cooking classes with like a partner in Italy, and they they just put together the best experiences. And we had this like full course, like you know, multi course meal, and they cooked for us and they taught us how to make the pasta from scratch. And that may sound really basic, but I just it was my first time ever going to Italy, and I was like, what is this? So everything from Italy is the answer. <laughs> I know it is. It's so funny. Every day, anything you have, you're like, this is amazing. This is the greatest thing I've ever had. Oh, like, so good. So I have such good. like recency bias that I'm like every, the last meal I ate, the best meal I've ever had. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Great answer there. And um, <laughs> so this question, so what is the last great book or article that you read or it can be listened to? Oh, that's a great one. Um, I would say I, I'm, I kind of reread a lot of books over and over again to like, re remind myself of the lessons I learned from them. Um, and so the book that it, it's not the most recent book I read, I'll admit, but it's the most impactful for me was the book, um, uh, cash flow. Wait, what was it? Cash flow. Oh man, I'm forgetting the name of it now. <laughs> I'll have to like, look it up, but it was basically, yeah. I, um, about is the guy that wrote like think and grow rich. Um, Robert yes. Saki, I believe it is. And he wrote something. Oh, cash flow quadrant. That's the name of it. Hmm. And it was basically explaining um, the, how you can own, you can work at a job, you can own your job, meaning like you're the owner, but you still have a day to day job that like you can't step away from. And then the path towards building a business and building wealth. And for me, I read it spring break senior year. So like, yeah, I mean, Miami with my friends for spring break of college. And I'm there reading a book on the beach because I'm a nerd. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't take this full time job offer I have because I'll never, I'll never be the business owner or never have the like, you know, entrepreneurship, like wealth that I was hoping to build, you know, naively in college. And um, I would say that, uh, you know, I have so much more life to live. I didn't have to do it then immediately after college, obviously, like I've learned that since then, but it kind of was just a wake up call to me of like the importance of considering entrepreneurship and like starting your own business and what can that can mean for your life and like the flexibility you have. And that was a really, really impactful. And so if you haven't read it, I recommend it. And then one of my other favorite books that I read at least once a year, if not more. And I'm ab about to pick it back up. I have it with me on this recent trip I'm on. Um, and it's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And this is mm -hmm. such like a, yeah, exactly. Everyone knows this book, but everyone like reads it once, thinks they remember the concepts and like move on. And I feel like that's the kind of book you have to go back to because everything in life is communication. Everything, Every how you speak to people, how you interact with them, your body language, how you treat people. And I don't just mean on a day-to-day -day basis, but like in very nuanced ways. Um, and that book just really opened my eyes to how impactful your communication can be and how much it can leverage your, you know, improve your life. Um, and that one's a fantastic one. So, yeah. <laughs> that is, those are good ones. The, um, the, the one that, or the, how to, uh, influence people. That one definitely, yeah. that one is like, it's just so, there's so much in it that that is the type of book that you have to constantly. Yeah, like like yeah. It's, it's dense in terms of it like, is. and it, it does get a little rep repetitive in terms of like, all right, I get it. You have to be a good communicator, but um, if you truly like take notes on some of the things, um, like how your body language, when you're talking to someone, how to, how to match them and how to um, you know, be a good listener instead of a speaker all the time. You know, I feel like most people are so willing to talk, 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 but listening is more important, especially when talking to clients. So yeah, that's my, yeah. that's my favorite at the moment. 
That's great. That's a good one. That is a good reminder for everyone. That's a good summer read. We should yeah. do a book club because it's that easy is by the pool. So like, good. yeah, like easy on the plane. It's easy to read, but it'll, it'll leverage your life tenfold. So good. That is awesome. And okay. So the last question here for you is what is the craziest thing that's ever happened to you while traveling? Oh gosh. Um, I was a, Oh my goodness. So many things, just so many things. I, (laughs) I feel like, especially when you're doing these fam trips, like you're not really in control of like what your schedule is or like what you're doing. Um, and so I was traveling a lot in the beginning, like the first few countries I was going to, other than the time I had at JetBlue, I was going on fam trips. And so I wasn't really in charge of like what we were doing or how it was going. So the first time I went on the trip by myself after doing a lot of travel with fans, um, I was going from Italy to, uh, to, I think it was Santorini airport, or it was like Athens to Santorini and we were getting ready to leave and, you know, all these strikes popped up, you know, all the strikes that always happen at the European airports. It's always brutal and it messes up all the travel plans. And we had one pop up and we had chosen like EasyJet or Ryanair or something like that. And we, our next flight was not going to be for another two weeks. I'm like, I'm going to be home in two weeks. I, I, you know, what are you talking about? So that was my first experience of sleeping in an airport and like crying to flight attendants saying, what do I do? How do I get to, you know, my next destination? I'm like 19 years old and not really sure how to, how to do travel just yet. So I would say I was very chaotic in my early days of traveling because I didn't really know what I was doing. I've got a down pat now, but in the beginning, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> That's so funny. I was chaotic at the beginning. That's how you I learn, was, though, you know? I, I just was. <laughs> okay. Oh, of course. I, I would say the my other favorite story uh, is that when I was at Virtuous to Travel Week the very first time as an advisor, um, I was 18 years old. Oh, I wow. Or 19. So I was trying to get into one of the reception events, and they literally wouldn't let me in because... <laughs> I was 18, I think it was 19. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm, I promise I won't drink. Like I just, I, I need to network. Like I'm here for business, like make an X on my hand. I don't care, but like, I need to go to this networking event. And I literally had to get um, someone from the Virtuoso team to like explain to them that I won't drink. I had to wear a wristband and like all this stuff oh just so I could gosh. go to the networking event. So did they just see you? Cause I don't remember them ever like checking IDs or anything. So do they just like, they, they just like kind of were like, like oh. cocktail parties and stuff so, because mm. a lot of, you know how they have all those like, like dinner and drink events afterwards. Yeah. It's not a part of the regular programming, but like everyone does these events and it was at like one of the restaurants, but like all these restaurants, bars and c- casinos in Vegas require you to be to 21 because obviously And so like, I couldn't even cross the casino floor without getting ID'd. So it was like really, really, really (laughs) crazy. So I had to like, you know, stay on the sidewalk around the casino. So I didn't get waved over or whatever. And it was at one of these restaurants or bars or something. And I was like, I swear I won't drink. (laughs) The things I've never thought about is like, there's so many conferences in Vegas. And Mm -hmm. if you're not 21, oh my gosh. Yeah. You can't even walk through like, that would be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my I gosh. couldn't even it's also so this, the first few fans I'd go on. I wasn't even you had to be like, I think, 18 to check. No, you had to be like 20 to check into a hotel by yourself or something. That's oh. been some of these like mo- I think it's mostly 18, but there were some hotels that wouldn't let me check in unless I was like 20. And I literally had to get like the fam, whoever was leading the fam to like literally sign for the room for me because <laughs> I couldn't. Whoa, We're this good is now. I'm older now. Th- yeah, now you're good. But this is a podcast right. first where it's like things in the industry that like we all participate in and just never yeah. even thought about that. I know. Wow. But I love it because we're getting new people into the industry. We're getting a lot younger totally. people. A lot of the co-pilots that we get on the platform range from literally like 18 to 75. So wow. we have a huge cool. spectrum of ranges. And so I love that we're getting a lot of younger people trying to get into the industry, but also a lot of older individuals as well that are maybe thinking, I don't want to have a full book of clients anymore that I'm client facing on. I just want to be in the industry and make a great income, but like not stress about that. And so we get a lot on that tail end as well. Yeah. That's what's so cool too. It's just the, you're, you're getting like teachers or people who are used to doing, yeah. you know, all different things. Like they're not ready to completely retire yet. So the whole range. So that's really awesome. I really like yeah. that. So thank Same. you so much again. <laughs> yeah, I know it's great. It's good for the industry and for com- this, the travel community. So really cool. And, and thank you so much. Thank you for sharing the story and all of the fun 
all the fun, the books and the crazy of stories. Course. Thank uh, you so much. Love I it. really loved it. <laughs> yeah. And thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of the Lounge with Travify Academy. And of course, thank you to our special guest, Grace, for joining us today. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast or subscribe to our YouTube channel for all of the latest episodes. And we hope you enjoyed our conversation today and join us again. But for now, stay safe and we'll catch you on the next flight. Thank you.